Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lauren. To get started, I'm just going to introduce the speakers. On the line, we have Ray Azarm, who is our Vice President of Enterprise Practice. He will be giving us a brief overview of our media and the services we offer. And we also have Matt Maines, who is the Director of Project Management, who will be leading the live demo. We also have our resident FOIA consultant, Anston Williams, here as well. So I'm going to pass it over to Ray Azarum, who once again is our VP of Enterprise Practice, and he will go ahead and get started with us on our webinar. Ray, go ahead. Great. Thank you, Lauren. Good afternoon and good morning to the folks from the West Coast. Thank you for joining us today. As you know, we're going to be talking about our, our case, case management platform, and specifically the solution that we'll talk about today will be around FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, public records. Uh, we'll go through essentially a background behind our company, our product, talk a little bit about the uh, application itself, and then I'll turn it over uh, to my colleague Matt Maines who's going to give you a demo of the product. Let me tell you a little bit about our company. Our company was founded in 2002. Uh, we're based in the Washington, D.C. metro area, as well as a few other offices, as you see on the screen. Um, our primary business is, uh, can be divided into two parts. Number one, we're a technology company around the case management platform that we're going to talk about mostly today. And number two, we're a traditional systems integrator that utilizes our R-Case platform along with our ECM uh, methodology and practice um, and try to solve uh, business problems. We're a, a veteran-owned small business, uh, have a bunch of certifications around process and service. Uh, you are probably familiar with um, uh, ISO and CMMI level three appraisal, but most of the time our partnership uh, started off uh, with our ECM practice. Um, you guys are familiar with the players, but you can also see them here, um, as well as just general IT services um, within our SI practice. Um, we have a number of different accolades in different areas. Um, uh, for example, we've been an Alfresco Federal Partner of the Year for three years. Uh, we have won a number of accolades from Open Text, Documentum, uh, and several other ones that, again, you can see um, uh, here within uh, uh, within this slide. So when you look at our portfolio overall, you can see that when we started the business, it was around ECM um, and records management. With that, several years ago through a project that we worked with FBI, uh, we decided to productize our case management system. And most of that, again, you'll get to see today and specifically around our uh, um, uh, uh, FOIA or the public records application, you'll be able to see how it works, what the solution is, what the interface looks like, and the workflow um, as Matt will take you through that whole uh, uh, demonstration of the application. But generally, again, our practice has been around ECM, uh, records management, and of course with that is case management, which is tied very much into that. It's important for these platforms to obviously have um, uh, you know, certain things covered. So, you know, we, we work on cloud or it can be an on-premise solution or it can be a hybrid. Uh, we're probably one of the few open source case management systems out in the market today. Um, and um, uh, with that, obviously, gets us a lot of community support uh, and work that outside of the company a lot of folks have contributed to and continue uh, contributing to. Our solution enablers really can be divided into three parts. Number one is our case, which is, again, the case management platform. We'll talk about that uh, a lot later on today, uh, followed by our content migration platform, and then followed by our, our media content cloud, which is our FedRAMP mod moderate uh, content services platform that leverages uh, not only our case, but also AWS, Alfresco, Documentum, uh, FSOft, et cetera. Um, and, and certain customers that want to be on our private cloud and want to have that uh, additional FedRAM protection, uh, they can certainly utilize that, but there are obviously many different options that they could um, use as well. When we think about case management, um, it's important to know how we define it. Um, case management to us is a intersection of a CRM system, a records management system, and a BPM process system, if you will. Um, so lots of different objects. Those objects could be a person object. It could be a document. It could be a data point. It could be a, um, many different things that are managed within a centralized application. And that's really what the guts of a case management is. 
if you divide case management into uh, different um, uh, types, uh, you, you would probably derive these four that are listed here. Anything from process to decision, which by the way constitutes FOIA or public records. It could be a service request, it could be an incident management, and it could be investigations as well. We'll talk about a few of these other ones in addition to FOIA so that you can get a flavor of what uh, case management uh, applications and solution sets we offer. Uh, but let's start off with FOIA, which is the, the main reason why we're all here today. So as you all know, FOIA has a very specific type of workflow associated with it. There is an initial request that comes in by somebody outside of the organization or the agency. Uh, they're requesting for some information. Uh, that kicks off some sort of a workflow. Clearly, a lot of that is done manually. Um, there is a lot of communication and collaboration that needs to happen. Most organizations, if they don't have a case management system, they're utilizing, you know, paper-based solutions, uh, Excel spreadsheets, and many manual steps uh, to do this work, which obviously becomes very inefficient in their processes. So lots of different pain points here. So what do we do to, to, to sort of affect that from an operation standpoint and also from a uh, workflow standpoint. So if you think about it pictorially, uh, when an agency or, uh, sorry, when a, when a citizen or a customer outside of the agency is requesting some sort of an information, that information needs to come into uh, the agency that uh, that individual, let's call that individual our case user in this case, will take it through the workflow of uh, that particular case. So in this case, it's an ingestion of that incoming request. Then there is some sort of a fulfillment that occurs. At times, there is legal that needs to get involved so that they can approve certain content that needs to go out or not. Maybe there is uh, um, a, a scenario where you have to redact certain portion of this, so redaction needs to be part of it. Uh, there is billing, there is uh, tracking of time, uh, there is maybe, uh, you know, uh, again, charging that time back to the original requester. All of that needs to be part of an application, uh, which it is as part of our R-Case platform. And then last but not least, uh, a response that goes back to the uh, original requester in the way of electronic most of the time or maybe a web uh, um, uh, uh, interface where they can go and take a look at the uh, response that uh, they received. So the benefits are very clear. Uh, obviously, if you have a centralized application that can manage uh, all those objects that we just described, it makes things a lot simpler. Uh, certainly. Uh, time to value in terms of getting that response back quicker um, is, is there. Um, as an agency, you'll be a lot more compliant responding back in a timely uh, fashion. Um, uh, you know, inevitably, the, the amount of error that you make in processing that request will go down. Um, and of course, easier collaboration, accessibility across the entire organization um, uh, goes without saying as well. So let's uh, quickly talk about uh, some of the other applications that may be interesting besides FOIA. Um, first and foremost, probably investigation. Um, you know, anytime there is an HR investigation or any type of investigation that you may have, that initial request needs to be logged in. It goes through a, a workflow that's obviously somewhat different, uh, but again, it needs to have that centralized repository or or management of that data so that you can. Um, you know, assign individuals, assign legal, and be able to then systematically and centrally address that particular incoming investigation that comes in. One that I really like is our audio video management or media management. Think about, um, uh, you know, law enforcement with body cams or uh, legal depositions or customer service phone calls that are getting recorded. All of these have to be turning into text. We utilize um, uh, AI and our integration with Amazon to provide this and uh, have integrated it very tightly within the application as well. And you can see some of the other ones. Again, I don't want to take time away from uh, our main uh, focus area today, which is FOIA. Um, I say that, and of course, the next slide is about our media management. This is one that really excites me, as you can tell. Um, again, uh, you know, this is one where we can ingest audio or video files, break them up, get, um, uh, you know, turn them into text and, and obviously, um, it, you know, include, the, include it or store it as part of the application uh, that we're processing for that particular case. Uh, the ROIs here are phenomenal. An hour of audio, video 
um, manually takes about six to eight hours to be transcribed. We can do it in minutes. Um, so again, uh, this has its own specific application, but since a lot of you guys are uh, part of federal or uh, state local government, you may find that you can leverage the existing application to do other solutions such as this. Let's talk a little bit of bits and bytes. If you look at our case from a process flow perspective, you can divide it into three parts. First is the ingestion of that content that comes in via the web, via email, via somebody who is making a phone call requesting for some information from an agency. Uh, the crux of the application is in the middle where we call automate. This is where you can uh, process the case itself, be able to provide a mechanism so that individuals that are involved in that FOIA request can, can get information from any different um, repository that they have access to. And then finally, it's connecting it to a backend. Backend could be any uh, backend repository, database, maybe a CRM, uh, or ultimately sending it to via email to the requester uh, that made the original request. Speaking of our backend players, these are some of the sampling of um, electronic content management players that we support today. Uh, there is more. Um, our technology can uh, integrate with any application that's CMIS uh, compatible um, out of the box. So it makes it really easy to be able to incorporate one of the three pillars of a case management system, as I said earlier today, which is uh, an ECM or a content repository. Lots of bits and bytes. Uh, Matt will go through some of this as we go through it. So again, you know, being able to have a form designer, uh, we didn't talk about uh, uh, analytics and reporting that's part of this. We talked about cost tracking, uh, billing, uh, faceted search, smart technology. Uh, these are some of the very, you know, some of them are, you probably have seen in other applications, but uh, some of them have also been unique uh, within our application, um, only because we want to make it special and we want to make it such that it's a competitive solution out in the market. Speaking of the ones that are special, um, I could probably divide this into these uh, items that you see here. Um, we have incorporated a bunch of microservices uh, within our application. Uh, uh, you know, one of them I described earlier, which is the whole uh, transcribe engine. Uh, those are our AI machine learning sort of uh, uh, areas that we try to tackle. Uh, we have recently um, partnered with uh, a robotic process automation um, company, and what that could do is affect a business process within a case that we're processing. So imagine a uh, FOIA analyst that wants to process an incoming content. Um, if we can reduce the amount of work that they do in addressing that particular request, uh, we have given that organization a lot of efficiency and optimization, and that's what we will do uh, with introducing robotic process automation as part of our platform uh, within the case management system. Um, licensing is very flexible, as you see here. Uh, there is, uh, uh, you know, the system itself is thin client-based, meaning both the administrator as well as any of the users utilize the system uh, via the web. Um, it's very low code. Uh, majority of the time when we deploy the solution, it's 95% out of the box with respect to FOIA. The other 5% may be configuration. You need to change a label here and there. Maybe you don't, you know, you don't necessarily subscribe to all the seven different workflows that we have. Uh, you can click on them, take them off, or put them back in and uh, redo the whole workflow so that it meets your specific agency's requirements. The application is infinitely scalable, both horizontally and vertically. So from a public sector related perspective, just so you know, we're part of GSA. Uh, both on two separate schedules, Schedule 36 and the IT70. We're also FedRAMP moderate, which uh, obviously when it comes to cloud implementation, it makes it really easy for us to um, state that for uh, uh, agencies that obviously are very sensitive to that. Uh, and this is the last slide, which is our list of our customers that we have today, just a sampling of them. I'm going to turn it over to Matt Maines, who is going to give you a demo of the product and specific solution around FOIA that we've been talking about. All right. So what we're going to go ahead and do, guys, um, is get into the workflow that Ray talked about. 
um, we're going to actually show you both the web portal um, and the actual art case FOIA application that your, you know, your FOIA officers, your FOIA approvers, folks that are fulfilling public record requests or FOIA requests would essentially see. And we're actually going to go through uh, essentially the use case of processing a request from front to back. Um, first thing we're going to go ahead and do, though, is kind of give you a lay of the land. So as you can see here, you have what we call our web portal. This is a web portal we provide uh, as an option to leverage. Um, once again, you can design your own web portal and utilize our APIs for ingestion, or you can leverage our web portal, which comes with three pages. One is specifically a FOIA request page. Um, this is a fully configurable web form, uh, so you can remove fields, change fields, use it as is. You can change the actual mandatory versus optional fields. Um, and then you also have what we call our request status page. This allows the end user, the requester, uh, to be able to track their actual request and the status where it is in the overall process. We also have a reading room that allows to uh, the end user to search for existing requests that have been uh, requested before and fulfilled and possibly shared with the public. Um, there are different types of configuration rules where you can um, actually share an individual request with the public um, after X number of times it's been released to an individual requester. So um, you also have the ability to manual or manually uh, share it with the actual public uh, through the application, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Additionally, um, we actually have uh, the Art Case FOIA application that we'll talk about today, and I'm going to go ahead and start there by logging in with an admin user. You're noticing I'm logging in with a manual login. We do have full support for single sign-on. So if you have requirements or customer requirements around single sign-on, we do support that out of the box through uh, basic configuration. We support many different uh, protocols for that. What you're noticing here is the landing page, and this is actually what every user would essentially see when they log in. And I want to tell you a little bit about the application before we jump right into the workflow. So as you can see here, we have on the left-hand side, we have all of the, the navigation or the different modules available throughout this application. This is an admin view, which means that I am seeing everything. Um, we're actually going to use one other user today that actually has a lot less access, and you'll notice that he just doesn't see these modules. He also will have a different dashboard. His personal dashboard uh, will look a little bit different because his role-based access control is different. Everything in the application is role-based driven. Um, so as you'll see here, this dashboard is specific to my user that is logged in. Uh, me being an admin, I can manipulate this dashboard. This is my jumping off location. So I can jump directly into specific places in the application. Maybe I wanted to see any of the two requests that are in the fulfill queue. If I click on that individual uh, column in the actual widget, it takes me out to the queues module. And you can see I've got access to all the different queues. Not everyone will have access to every queue. The great thing about the dashboard is, is that you can configure these widgets um, uh, or extend them to meet all of your different uh, values or metadata or KPIs that you're looking to track. Um, and then you can obviously hyperlink it to where you want in the application. So maybe I wanted to look at a detailed request. It's actually going to jump me right into the request module, and then I can see a different view of a request uh, from this perspective. Um, the queue and request modules are very similar in the way that they are handled. Um, the request can come in and go through a queue workflow, or maybe you have a small team and you have one person that does all of your FOIA requests. Well, they can do that right here from the request module and take it all the way through the process or workflow from a single screen. We'll use a little bit of both of those modules today. Additionally, we'll talk about some of these other modules as we go through the workflow. Um, we may have time towards the end to go into some of these in detail, but I do want to point out some of the specific ones. Um, we do have a search module. This is a full, ser uh, full text search um, and full metadata search. Uh, it does have a type ahead, um, and it allows you to do a like search, exact search, exact phrase searches. Um, and as you can see here, it pulls back essentially all metadata and text throughout the application. We also do uh, allow for uh, OCRing in the background, so if you upload image-only files, we will do our best to uh, OCR each and every one of those, index that content, and then allow you to search across it. 
you do have the ability to configure all of these elements. So whether it's categories or what we call facets here, um, to be able to narrow your information, uh, even the columns, you can export this data, you can sort the columns, you can do, um, you can remove columns, things along those lines. The reports module is where all our canned reports are. Here's just a sample set. We do support all the DOJ metrics. Um, so once again, you may be uh, working with a federal agency or you may be a fed from a federal agency that wants to, uh, to utilize our case FOIA. We do support DOJ reports out of the box, but you do have the ability to create your own reports in the actual reports designer, which is a drag and drop designer um, that can be leveraged from the admin module. We'll talk a little bit about cost and time tracking. Uh, you do have the ability to track time and cost to, uh, associated to each request, um, and that allows you to uh, track the time and your charge role and possibly the individual hourly amount for that role. Um, and then it essentially ties to your billing and invoicing tool within each request. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through the workflow. And then the last thing that we'll end with in this kind of overview is this is where the brains of the application is. This is the admin module that allows you to configure everything from security, access to individual modules, granular privileges, uh, creating your own groups, your own um, um, uh, roles within the application. Once again, out of the box, all of this is predefined, so you will have out of the box roles. You have uh, once you essentially sync your Active Directory or your Open Active Directory, your Open LDAP, whatever it may be you can essentially tie those to existing art case roles out of the box and be up and running within minutes. Um, but you do have the ability to extend a lot of that. And we'll talk about changing some of those things, restricting access to certain queues, um, the ability to change labels. Unfortunately, we won't have enough time to cover everything today, but we'll touch on some of the high-level configuration items. With that being said, let's go ahead and go into the workflow and show you really how, it inter how that process interacts with not only the web portal, but the actual application. So the first thing that we're going to do is go right back out to the web portal, and we're going to actually go ahead and put in, it at minimum, we're going to put in the mandatory field. So I'm going to go through here and just type in this information. Once again, this is a configurable form, so you do have the ability to change the information that you want to collect uh, from your individual requesters. Um, you may have a, an actual uh, form that you use today um, that is very specific to your specific uh, agency or maybe a customer that you're working with. Once again, this is fully configurable and can be changed very easily. We're going to go in here and we're just going to put in some ba a basic description. I just want the actual 2018 uh, budget report. Once again, this is a full rich uh, text field, which means you can add um, you know, paragraph after paragraph. You also have the ability to just put it in a single uh, uh, a line item, whatever it may be. You can also specify the date range uh, to help the actual FOIA office or the public request office narrow down and get your results back to you quicker. Um, you also have the ability to upload in certain situations where you have to add a description document. Maybe you're looking for a very detailed set of information. Maybe you have to actually give a consent document to consent who you are or prov uh, provide a proof of identity. You can upload those right into the actual form. You do have the ability to uh, specify category, delivery method. Maybe you want this to be submitted through the portal, but you don't want to actually um, get it electronically back through email. You want to actually do it through mail. Once again, these are all optional uh, out of the box. You have the ability to uh, request a waiver or let the folks know in the, uh, the actual FOIA or public uh, request office you know, what you're willing to spend. So let's just say I'm willing to spend $100. When I submit this, you'll notice I've got a preview page here. It gives me a preview of everything I've populated in this specific form. Um, I do have the ability to go back and edit this, or in this case, I can go ahead and let the system know or the robot know that I'm not a robot, and I'll go ahead and submit this off. As you can see here, it is going to tell you that you uh, have submitted this successfully, um, and you will essentially get an email from the system automatically. Um, once again, this is just part of the standard workflow that ArtCase offers. ArtCase actually offers um, what we call a correspondence module where you can build your correspondences and dictate whether you want them to be sent out manually or automatically. Before I actually go into the application and show you uh, what this new web portal submission looks like and start processing it, I do want to go ahead quickly and open up the actual email. 
So this is the email that automatically was sent. Um, once again, you can actually configure your own logo. Um, it did tell the end user what the information was, kind of what was processed, who it's been assigned to. Um, and once again, the most important is their ID that they can actually use to track the information. Additionally, we also submitted what we call a correspondence. This is a correspondence that can be configured by uh, the actual office. Um, and once again, this is just a document. It can be sent in Word or it can be sent in PDF. And as you can see here, it actually used our correspondence template with merge terms to populate the actual document. So now the individual requester has record of their actual received uh, uh, request that has been sent to the office. So let's actually take a look very quickly before we jump into the actual application. Let's jump into the request status page. So immediately, the individual user has the ability to type in the necessary mandatory information and see at any time where the request is in the process. Currently, it's in the review stage. Okay. So let's go into the application and take a look at this. Since I'm in as an admin user, I'm going to go ahead and log out and use that secondary user we talked about. I'm going to use Owen Officer. This is the actual uh, part of this demo. We actually assign it directly to a specific user and group. Um, and as you can see, Owen has a little bit different view. Um, his modules are very restrictive. His dashboard's much different. Um, he doesn't even have access to the queues module at all. His only job in this specific demo is to essentially take any requests that are coming into the intake queue and review them. Make sure that they're complete. So let's go ahead and take the one that we just created and jump right into it. He will only have access to see the ones that are assigned directly to him. That's the default view in the request module. And you'll notice all the information that has come in. So high-level information up at the top gives you when it was created, uh, when it was officially received, who the actual assigned group is, um, what is the actual overall due date. Right now we have it configured to uh, be processed in 20 days. Um, that's the federal uh, mandate of 20 days to respond uh, unless there's an extension of some sort. Uh, we also have a, a due date calculator. Um, you can control that through admin, and we'll talk about that towards the end. Once again, he has the ability to do a couple of things. He can review the overall data that came in. He also can review the information about the requester. He could even go into, and once again, you can use either the tree view on the left-hand side or the icons on the right. He also can see the actual document section of this request. So you're noticing there's a lot of content um, associated, whether it's metadata or actual physical uh, documents associated to an individual request. The first documents you're going to notice is we create um, a request form and a request acknowledgement letter. These are the automatic correspondence templates that are, are created on the fly. Once again, these are fully configurable forms, and you also don't have to leverage these at all if you decide not to, to, to leverage them. So at this point, he would probably open this up. He may even open up the request form in our viewer and make sure that the information looks appropriate. So he can view it in our viewer. Um, he can look at, once again, the details. Um, he can see if there's any other information that he needs to review. He can see the description. He can see if uh, the person wanted to waive fees, things along those lines. He can also expand this, take a look at it in a different way, in a different view, um, to actually see the information. And we'll talk a little bit about the bells and whistles of this viewer as we go through the workflow. So long story short, um, let's just assume due to time sensitivity today, let's go ahead and have this be assigned. So maybe the, the goal of uh, Owen is just to triage this, make sure it has the information. If the information is not correct, he could send an email directly out to the requester by clicking send email and ask for additional detail to narrow the criteria. So we're going to go ahead and we are going to assign this to my user. We're going to use my admin user the rest of the day, um, so then I can show you all the different bells and whistles. At this point, as soon as it's been assigned out, Owen can complete this task and he is done. He can then move over and he can actually see that this is now moved on to the next step in the overall workflow. So let's go ahead and log out and come in as the actual admin user, Matt. 
Additionally, what's going on in the background, as things in the application are assigned, whether they're request assignments, whether they're, um, uh, whether they're task assignments, maybe a new document's been uploaded, we can actually set up email notifications for specific events to then send out emails to individual users. So as I got assigned this individual uh, request, it sent me an email to let me know that I was assigned to actually work on it. And as you can see here, it just came through to let me know I have a new assignment. And I can actually jump right into that by hitting open request and it'll take me right to the application. And it will actually load the, um, the actual request here. So as you can see here, we do have a, a new request and I'm viewing it from the request module. But I do have the ability to view it from the queues module, which is what I'm gonna do now. I do have access to all the queues since I am an admin user, but let's just imagine that Matt is the person that all he does is fulfill the request. So his goal is to look at this request and basically find all the documents, redact all the documents, make sure that everything is done. This is where most folks will spend a majority of their time. We'll show a little bit in admin um, where you can configure how many days an individual request can stay in each of the individual queues. So um, what I wanna show you here is that essentially you can see that this one has been in the queue for zero days and essentially you have X number of days still to complete this. So you have 11 days to complete this, but you have 20 overall days to complete the entire re request. So I've got 11 days to fulfill this. So at the end of the day, I can process this in 11 or less days, then I will not be overdue essentially with this request. So this is what it looks from the looks like from the queue details perspective. So normal day-to-day -day process, um, I'm a, a person that actually fulfills the request. I will get assigned by an email. I'll open that email, take me right out to this actual page. And the first thing that I'm gonna do is obviously review the information. What do they want? Who is the person? Um, what's the information that they're, they're seeking? So descriptions to 2018 budget report. If I still need more data, once again, I can send an email directly out to the end user um, or the requester that requested this. Um, I can clarify that information. I can send emails out and back into the system very easily. Let's assume that I do have the right information that I need. I can do quite a few different things. Um, this is a full-fledged document management um, uh, tool built right into your actual request form, or your, excuse me, your request module. So as you can see here, if I right click on a folder, I can do a lot of different things. I can add a subfolder, I can go out and pick a document, whether it's on my network drive, my local drive, a repository that I have access to. I also can search within the application for other documents that have been used in responses. So maybe you want to go out and find a, a document that's already been fully redacted that you know has been part of another response. You can go out and do that. You also have the ability to generate correspondences. So maybe you are um, planning to uh, deny this for some reason. Uh, you can take this through a denial path. Um, you also have the ability to send a, a, a final production letter, as I have here as an example, with your end result or your response. You also have the ability, like I said, to go out and pick a doc type and actually pull in some files, and I'm gonna use a, a few samples today. So when I upload these documents, a couple of things are actually happening. Um, the system is actually uploading these into the uh, content repository, whatever that backend content repository may be. Um, we do have full support for any format, whether it be um, um, uh, PDFs, docs, like you have docx, uh, spreadsheets, e uh, EML files. Uh, rich media files, um, whether they're audio, video, those types of things. There's no limit on the actual size. So as you can see here, um, we have not only uploaded these, but if any of these were image only, we would have sent these over through the OCR process um, if you have that configured to be turned on, which would then be trying to create your brand new version. And that's where you see the version control here. So as we work on these documents, the version control will be updated. So let's go ahead and load one of these documents in the viewer. I can load as many documents in the viewer that I want to. Um, it's just going to add additional tabs to my actual window here. Um, maybe I don't want to see the details on the right side. I can actually expand and take a look at this document.
Okay, so I can scan this document. Uh, maybe I need to redact certain areas. Um, let's go ahead and let's just do a manual redaction. So we'll go in here. Uh, we'll redact that area. Maybe we need to redact this area. Maybe we only need to redact this word. You can do as many redactions as you want. And then you also can specify the actual exemption code. Um, these are the sample uh, list of exemption codes. Um, for those of you that are familiar with federal exemption codes, you'll notice um, that's what is here. And we can go through and add exemption codes, or essentially you can burn things without adding an exemption code associated. If I hit the Save button, I actually am just saving the annotations. So once again, I still have the ability to select and move this around, select and delete it. Um, I could do a lot to this document. This is not affecting the original version. It's only putting an overlay. So at some point when I do decide to burn this, um, I actually will create a brand new version too. So essentially I'm not affecting the original version. Maybe I want to go ahead and load the other document in and view that additionally. Um, so I can go ahead and I can also double click and view that. I'm going to load this, uh, this document I call the SSN document. This is just a sample document that allows me to do uh, what we call uh, essentially um, uh, key term searches um, to find information in this document. So instead of me redacting one by one like I did on the budget sample document, I actually can go over to this little search and I can actually search for either keywords. Um, so maybe I wanted to search for, um, you know, uh, FOIA. I can actually search and it will highlight any time that it actually sees FOIA and it will narrow down the pages. As you can see, it is highlighted here. It starts on the first one. I also could go in and do things like Social Security search. So I want to do a pattern search. And as you can see here, it's going to pull back the pattern. Okay. The great thing about this is not only is it pulling back the pattern, but we also have the ability to redact all matches or we can redact each match one at a time and it will take us to a systematic way. Well, for time purposes, let's just go ahead and select to redact all of them. And I'm going to go ahead and select, obviously, X6 for the PII here. And I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. And once again, now, if you look at any of these, just to show you, it automatically put X6 on every single one of these. So you can do redactions in bulk um, uh, to, to actually allow for uh, speeding through this actual uh, document and redacting specific information you know is going to be prevalent. So just one of the options there. So let's go ahead and assume that we want to save this information. Um, and in this case, I'm going to go ahead and burn one of the documents now. So we'll go ahead and click the burn. And what it's going to do here is it's not only going to save the original version, it's going to actually create a brand new version for us to view uh, so you can see what the actual burn version looks like. So it's going to refresh our screen and it's going to reload our version 2 document. Um, additionally, we're saving and once again, this version to the content repository. That's going on behind the scenes at all time. So at any one time, if, you want to, if you're a records manager, you can browse out and see that information. As you can see here now, we're on version 2, um, and you can see all the different actual uh, redactions throughout this document as you tab through. Okay, a lot of other bells and whistles, but due to time, I'm not going to be able to show everything, but you do have the ability to zoom in and out. You can jump to different pages. You can fit to, to width, fit to page, things along those lines. Okay, so let's just assume that this user has fulfilled everything. We spent the time we wanted to spend on this. Um, maybe uh, as part of this process, we needed to send a task to one or many folks to help us work on this. Maybe you wanted to send a task over to um, Sally to actually help you research and find the documents. You could do that right here from the actual uh, request window. And it would keep track of all the tasks and the status and, and what you're waiting on to get done. So let's go ahead and complete this by hitting the next or the complete button and it will change the fulfill queue to the approved queue. I'm showing this from an admin perspective so I can show you that I can just kind of take this work this request and fulfilling this request to a specific workflow. But once again, if I only had access to the fulfill queue, I'd only see a next button. Basically what that would do is, is it would just save the current request, send it over to the approved queue to the next uh, queue, and it would queue up the next request for me to work on in my queue. But for the purposes of this demo, I'm going to take you all the way through the workflow. So let's assume that my job is the approver. 
uh, is to look at, once again, the detailed information. Um, maybe I need to go in and review the documents. I could go through and see any information associated, see the, the redactions that are already there. Maybe I don't want that redaction. Maybe it doesn't need to be redacted. I can actually go in. At this point, I could do my part and delete it. Um, I then can say resave. Um, I can go back through the document, continue to review, make sure that these documents are done and appropriate. And I'm going to assume, due to time purposes, I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing. I'm just going to burn this other document we didn't burn yet. Maybe it didn't need to be burned, or maybe it needed to be my, uh, reviewed and approved by me first. While that's refreshing, you also have the ability at any stage in the process uh, to uh, either add uh, an extension. Um, so we can configure how many days that you can extend. By default, it's 10 days, um, but you can add a calculation for extending this request, and it will send an automatic correspondence letter to let the requester know why you're extending it. You also have the ability to send this through litigation. Um, basically, it would hit an additional queue, uh, which we call general counsel. If you do not select that, it will bypass that queue completely. So thus far, just to summarize, we have had Owen uh, take this through intake, review it, send it to someone to start fulfilling. Matt has now fulfilled it, taken it through approval, has now burned all of his actual copies, and he is now ready to essentially take this um, to essentially be ready to release this. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to take both of these documents, and we're going to actually copy them right into the response folder. The reason that we're actually copying them into the response folder is that this response folder, anything that is in this folder is what gets delivered to the end user, or we know that has been approved by the internal team to be sent back out or printed and snail mailed or, or essentially be printed and ready to be picked up, that type of thing. Additionally, you do have the ability to generate what we call installments. So there may be a situation where you get a request that may take you extended amounts of time. It may take you 45, 50, 60 days to process this, and you want to send batches of essentially response documents to the end user. You can do that from any queue. Um, anything you put in the response folder, you can actually generate a zip, and it will actually send out an automatic email called an installment which will allow them to be notified that they have an installment they can either download on the portal, they can come pick up, they can, um, that it will be coming to them in the mail, whatever it may be. So you don't have to take the, the request all the way through the workflow just to deliver response documents because there will be cases where a response may take a much longer period of time than, say, 20 days or even 20 plus the extension. Well, now that we've approved this, we put it in the response folder, let's go ahead and complete this. Once this has been completed, it's going to move it into a billing queue. So the billing queue we could spend a lot of time on, but I will give you just kind of a high-level view of what we offer. Um, you can actually integrate really with any third-party uh, processing tool, um, whether it's pay.gov, whether it is another credit card pay payment processor. Once again, we leverage our APIs and that processor to pull in the actual data. Okay. Um, once again, this is something that, uh, that can be configured in many different ways. First off, you can add individual line items um, to this individual request. So maybe I want to charge them for a research fee. So let's just say we're going to say $100 for a research fee. Um, I can add in a printing fee, whatever it may be. I also have the ability to generate a time sheet and a cost sheet, and I'll show that here in a minute what that looks like. And once you process that time sheet internally, it will add a line item to your individual request. As you can see here, though, you do have the ability to generate invoices with a single click. You also have the ability to view those invoices. You can actually email those invoices directly out to the end user and, once again, go through the normal payment processing. So your payment processing method today may be accepting checks through the accounting office. Well, the accounting office would let you know when X check is coming in, and let's just assume that's the most simplistic method. Let's just say that check you know, one, two, three came in and it paid for the $100. Now you have an even balance. Um, and once again, you can see, uh, the, you can update these invoices and send them back out to the customer if they decide they need that. Once you've completed the billing step and you want to release this, you can actually hit complete and release it. I do want to mention that the billing step is an optional step. You do have the ability to configure it as a mandatory step.
In this demo, if I did not collect payment at all, um, I could still release this if I chose to do so. Before I actually release this, I am going to show you one more time where we are in the process. It is now updated to the billing step um, in the overall workflow. So let's go ahead and complete this story by hitting complete, and it's actually going to release this. And since this was an electronic uh, web portal um, request, it is going to send an email to the requester letting them know that their request has been released, and they can actually go right in and they can take a look at that. So let's go ahead and close out of this, and you'll notice 116 is now in the release queue. So if I go ahead and click Quick Search, you'll notice that it's now released, and they have the ability to now download their content. And we do this from a zip file, and the reason we do a zip file is because this could be uh, two documents like it is today, or it could be hundreds of documents. So obviously you're not going to be able to email those. Um, we do it from a zip perspective, so that way you can send a ton of content to the end user. We do have configuration to send as in native format or to convert to PDF on the actual response, and we convert ours to PDF in this environment or this demo. So if we go, go ahead and double, ch uh, double check and take a look, this is the document that we are working on today, if you guys remember. So summarize, we have taken the FOIA request from the web portal all the way through processing it internally um, and then to an actual response to the end user. The admin module is pretty robust in the fact that our case allows you to configure many things from the front end, one of those being syncing your Active Directory. So day one, whether you use um, uh, our cloud services, whether you use uh, on-premise, whether you use a hybrid uh, pr perspective, you have the ability to leverage your own Active Directory. You can leverage our Active Directory functionality or service. Um, but once again, this can be configured by you um, and essentially um, pulled in your or sync in your organization hierarchy or all of your different groups. Those groups, obviously, if you drive down into them, you'll see all the different users in those groups, mine being one of the users we use today. And from there, you actually can tie those groups to individual roles. So you can have one or many groups tied to a role. So as you can see here, I've got two groups tied to the admin role. Um, we've got uh, a role of officer, which we used Owen today. He's only tied to one group. So any of the, the users in that group have the role officer access. That role allows you to dig into individual privileges. So you can r regulate all of your privileges for all of your different roles. Real-time, runtime, you can control access to the application. You also have the ability to restrict modules. So if you decided that you wanted to restrict modules, maybe you didn't want um, a subscriptions module. So you decide you don't want that. You have these individual roles that have access to it. Real time, you can restrict it now. There's no longer a subscription module. So that's how you can see the actual application will re react to what you configure. We've got a lot of other things that you can figure, everything from calendar integration. We do have Outlook integration for email and shared calendaring. Uh, we have document delivery functionality. It allows you to uh, integrate uh, the ability to send emails in and out of the system. Uh, we allow you to uh, manage your email templates. Uh, we allow you to manage your, your overall um, um, uh, uh, email capability, whether it's using Exchange configuration, what it may, whatever it may be. You can manage your dashboard widgets. This is where all the widgets would show, even the ones that you extend and create, and give certain roles access and certain roles no access. Same thing from a reports configuration perspective, uh, all the different reports and who has access. You also have a reports designer here. We don't have time to go into that today, um, but this is a full-fledged designer where you can drag and drop. Uh, essentially, any metadata that is collected in the database can then be reported on and can be uh, in tabular form, can be um, uh, pie charts, line charts, those types of things. Some of the other things that you can do throughout the application, all of the labels, so maybe there's terminology that you're not used to or that you don't want to use. Uh, maybe your terminology throughout the application is not FOIA. Maybe it's public request. You can go in and you can change this information. Maybe you want to uh, quickly change a module name. Well, you can go in here. See, it's pretty robust. There's 772 just in the admin module alone, and you have many different modules you can change labels for. 
In like mind or uh, like way, you can actually change all the drop downs in the application. So today we talked a little bit about um, uh, specific file types. So here are your request documents, audio documents, video documents. You can add all the document types you want. You would see in the drop down there. You also have the ability to configure a lot around FOIA. Um, there is a concept of being able to take things through the queues, uh, how long they can stay in each of the queues, how much time does it take to complete overall. You can drive that information down to your specific rules, your timelines for each and every queue and the overall request here in the admin module. You also have the ability to uh, basically set a request at receive date automatically, or you can actually set it up where you have to manually enter that once you have, say, communicated with the customer to lock in the criteria and scope of their request, and then that's what kicks off the overall workflow. Like I said, you can change logos on the login page, the header page, the emails. Um, you can configure what uh, content repository you want. Ray alluded to anything CMS compliant. Um, and one I missed here was the correspondence templates. We have a lot of out-of-the-box correspondence templates for uh, automatic denial of request, the request forms, appeal forms, a lot of things we didn't get a chance to get into today. With that being said, um, I've covered kind of a high-level view of what Art Case Boy has to offer, but I do want to leave some time for questions. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Lauren um, so she can actually review and field any questions that have come in during this demo. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Matt. All right. Let's look. We have a couple questions that came in. First one is, if I need a system up and running in less than three to six months due to upcoming mandate, can that be done with ArtCase? Absolutely. So I'll take that one. Um, thanks, Lauren. So th that was a pretty um, common question that we get. Um, uh, for example, we have implemented uh, two customers that had the same concern. Um, we actually implemented two in the last uh, couple of months, and both of those were essentially two to three month engagements. Um, uh, those were not... Uh, those were not directly out of the box, so we did do quite a bit of configuration. They, they wanted specific things done to meet exact requirements for them, um, and that was all done in essentially a two-month two period. Um, and that we're talking um, from the engagement of requirements to the, uh, the sprints that we ended up doing, delivering specific things every couple of weeks, um, to essentially training UAT and go live in that time period. So yes, it can be done pretty easily with, with the art case FOIA and the, the ease of use with the configuration. Great. Thanks, Matt. All right, let's see. We have at least time for at least one more question. Is smart technology built into art case? If so, what is built in? So when we talk about smart technology, I'd like to divide that maybe into two parts. One is AI components. We talked about the fact that we have, you know, this whole media services framework that's integrated into our application. And, you know, in that particular case, it's using the AWS transcribe engine that I talked about, which obviously drastically reduces the amount of time that folks will spend transcribing a, an audio or video file. But when I hear smart technology, I probably think about things like, you know, requesting for suggestions as the person who is solving a particular case or addressing a particular case. Maybe, um, you know, requesting deduplication is something that uh, needs to be included as part of FOIA. It's a very, very common thing that we run into with our customers. So the two examples that I gave are things that are coming at the beginning of Q2 uh, within our platform. And uh, the main reason for all these smart technologies, AI, you know, you know, you can even bundle the robotic process automation, is that we're trying to affect the business of that particular workflow. So in this case being FOIA, uh, by including all of these, we reduce the time that it takes to process that incoming FOIA request and thereby help that agency or that department get to the answers faster. Thanks, Ray. It looks like we have one last quick question here. Does Art Case provide bulk redaction and exemption functionality? Absolutely. So we didn't get a lot of, we didn't have a lot of time to spend on that, but hopefully I showed enough information. So we have a redaction built into the viewer. You have the ability to uh, redact uh, a single redaction uh, multiple places on the actual document. You do have the ability to search and do uh, batch redact, uh, redaction. Um, we have the uh, suggested or keyword searches essentially to uh, find specific content 
content and information uh, to redact. Uh, so, so yes, we do have full redaction built into the application. No need to download it and say redact it in Adobe. Uh, that's one of our pain points we see with most of our customers. So it is all built into the application. All right, thanks, Matt. And looks like we're just about at time. So I just want to wrap up and say thank you to everyone who registered and attended our FOIA public records webinar. We really appreciate you spending your time with us. If you had any additional questions that we were not able to get to um, during this specific webinar, please email us at sales at our media .com, as you can also see on the screen. And we'd love to have a conversation with you outside of this webinar if you have any more detailed questions that we weren't unable to answer. Once again, I thank you all for your time and I hope you have a great rest of your day.